with Professor Shannon D. Williams. Dr. Williams is Associate Professor in History at the University of Dayton. She's a historian of the African-American experience with research and teaching specializations in women's religious and black freedom movement history. And Professor Williams is the author of the forthcoming book, Subversive Habits, Black Catholic Nuns in the Long African-American Freedom Struggle, which is coming out from Duke University Press next month, but I understand the Kindle version may be even available sooner. Um, Dr. Williams' research has been supported by a range of fellowships, grants, and awards, including a Scholar in Residence Fellowship and the Schoenberg Center for Research in Black Culture in New York City, the Postdoctoral Fellowship in African American Studies at Case Western Reserve University, a Charlotte Newcomb Doctoral Fellowship in Religion and Ethics from the Woodrow Wilson National Foundation, and Albert Beveridge Grant from the American Historical Association, and the John Tracy Ellis Dissertation Award from the American Catholic Historical Association. A distinguished lecturer for the Organization of American Historians and a member of the Executive Council of the American Catholic Historical Association, Professor Williams' work has been published in the Journal of African American History, American Catholic Studies, The Washington Post, America Magazine, and The National Catholic Reporter. I just read um, the last American Magazine um, last week. And following Dr. Williams' presentation, we'll hear from Dr. Tim Neary, who is serving as a respondent and a dialogue facilitator for our event today. Dr. Neary is professor and chair of the history department here at Salve and director of the American Studies Program. And over the past two years, he's also been a member of the Mercy Interdisciplinary Faculty Collaborative on Race as a Macaulay Scholar. Dr. Neary's teaching and research intersects with issues of race and religion, and we're eager to um, engage with you as well um, in our conversation. So as you can see, we're joined um, by just really tremendous um, um, partners here today, but also by all of you. We have, um, I think, almost 100 faculty and staff and students, uh, trustees, community members here at Salve, as well as colleagues from our peer Mercy institutions and the Conference for Mercy Higher Ed and members of the Institute of the Sisters of Mercy of the Americas. And we're thrilled to be able to be together with all of you here today and look forward to your engagement in the dialogue portion of our event. Um, we'll begin with the address from Shannon Williams, um, Professor Williams, um, and then we'll move to the dialogue with Dr. Neary, Professor Neary, and then um, engage with conversation with all of you. But throughout today's event, please um, share any questions you have in the chat and we'll be collecting those throughout the um, program to prepare ourselves for that conversation. So for now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Williams for our Macaulay Institute Critical Concern Lecture, Confronting a Silenced Past, Black Catholic Nuns in the United States History. Dr. Williams. Thank you so much for that introduction. And thank you all for joining us. Um, I know that we're in that time of the semester where there are many looming deadlines. So I really appreciate everyone uh, for joining us for uh, today's event. Also, before I begin my formal remarks, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Macaulay Institute and all the faculty and staff who were involved in organizing uh, this afternoon's event. Um, this work certainly contributes to the intellectual um, uh, community of any campus, and I'm just really grateful for the opportunity to be with you to share, and I just want to thank everyone whose labor uh, is involved, was involved in um, putting together this event. What I want to do in, the, in our next 45 minutes is to really give you an overview or introduce you to my book, uh, Subversive Habits, Black Catholic Nuns and the Long African-American Freedom Struggle. I want to give you a sense of how I came to study the history of Black Catholic sisters in the United States. I will uh, introduce you to one of the core arguments of my book. And then I will conclude by um, sort of briefly sort of giving you an overview of why I argue that Black Sisters history matters. And then um, we'll sort of transition into the conversation piece. And I look forward to as many questions, uh, answering as many questions as time allows. 
So again, the title of my talk for today is Confronting a Silent Past, Past Black Catholic Nuns in United States History. And again, it is based off of my forthcoming book, Subversive Habits. And interestingly enough, um, how I came to this project was really by chance, although I think it's better to frame that conversation and to, to frame, frame that journey as one of providential serendipity. Subversive Habits began as an attempt to make sense of what I consider to be an extraordinary news story and photograph that I stumbled upon in early 2007. At the time I was in graduate school um, in a seminar in African-American history in desperate search of a paper topic, um, seeking to impress my professor, uh, the incomparable Dr. Deborah Gray White, who was one of the pioneers of black women's history. And so I had taken to going into our library and going through microfilmed uh, editions of black owned newspapers in search of a little known dimension of the American past. And while scanning through a roll of the Pittsburgh Courier, um, I finally encountered a 1968 article announcing what was a Black Power Federation of Catholic Nuns called the National Black Sisters Conference. The article's title alone, Black Sisters Way Contradictions in Christian and Secular Community, immediately piqued my interest. However, it was the accompanying photograph of four smiling Black Catholic nuns that steadied my hand on the microfilm reader that day. Until that moment, I, a lifelong Catholic, had never seen a Black nun, except in a Hollywood film. In fact, the only sister that I knew at that time was Sister Mary Clarence, um, the fictional character played by Whoopi Goldberg in the um, critically acclaimed Sister Act film franchise. Deeply ashamed of my ignorance, I soon learned that I was not alone. Even my mother, who had attended Catholic schools for the entirety of her formal education, and who in 1974 became one of the first three Black women to graduate from the University of Notre Dame in Indiana, was unaware of the existence of Black nuns in our church. And that's my mother on the left in pink. No, only white nuns taught us in our schools, my mother relayed to me on the telephone later that evening. But I wish I had known. I wish we'd had Black nuns in Savannah when I was growing up. Stunned by my mother's revelation, I set out to learn as much as I could about the National Black Sisters Conference and to understand the roots of the invisibility of Black Catholic sisters in our lives. From Father Cyprian Davis's landmark study of the US Black Catholic community, I discovered among many things that there had been Black nuns in my mother's hometown of Savannah, Georgia in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Before anti-Black prejudice and violent threats pushed these holy women out, members of two separate all black sisterhoods had helped to lay the foundation for and ensure the survival of the city's black Catholic educational system. Their heroic efforts made my mother's and by extension, my own journey into Catholicism possible. Yet the white nuns and priests who taught my mother and hundreds of other black children in Savannah during America's civil rights and black power years never once alluded to black sisters in their lessons. According to my mother, our white educators did not teach any black history or art either. And after calling and writing a host of Catholic institutions to track down some of the sisters and ex-sisters who had established the National Black Sisters Conference, I finally began to understand why. The saga of America's black women who dared to be poor, chaste and obedient is largely untold, wrote Sister Mary Sean Copeland in 1975. It is an uneasy story not only because it is rooted in the American dilemma, racism, but also because the position of woman in an oppressed group is traditionally delicate and strategic. Now, by the time that I interviewed her, Dr. Copeland was a distinguished professor um, at Boston College and the first black president of the Catholic Theological Society of America. She had also been out of religious life for 13 years. In the 1960s and 1970s, however, Dr. Copeland, who was the first African-American Felician sister in Detroit, Michigan, and who later became an, an Adrian Dominican nun, had been one of the National Black Sisters Conference's most visible leaders. She had also done more than anyone else to preserve their memory in the face of marginalization and erasure. In addition to publishing the first scholarly article on the National Black Sisters Conference, Dr. Copeland in the early 2000s arranged for the deposit of the organization's papers at Marquette University. I'm so glad you're interested in the Black Sisters Conference, she expressed to me during our first conversation. We've been waiting on someone to tell this story. 
Now, while Dr. Copeland's willingness to share her experiences with me proved pivotal, it was Dr. Patricia Gray, the National Black Sisters Conference's founding president, and one of the four black four nuns featured in the Pittsburgh Courier photograph who radically changed my focus and the focus of my book. Routinely described by her female and male peers as one of the most intellectually talented and charismatic Catholic sisters of her generation, Gray, who was known in religious life as Sister M. Martin de Porres, had been the conference's heart and soul in its formative years. As Pittsburgh's first Black religious sister of mercy and the conference's leading public voice, Gray was also the face and force of what people were calling then the new Black nun. However, in 1974, Dr. Gray, Gray abruptly departed religious life and stopped giving interviews related to the National Black Sisters Conference. Indeed, in our first conversation, she told me that the producers of Eyes on the Prize had contacted her and she had said no. Um, so I was very, very lucky that she was willing to say yes to me um, when I first met her in 2007. I don't like to look back, Dr. Gray frequently repeated during the first of our many conversations over the years. However, after I presented her with a recently published book on Catholic sisters activism and the black freedom struggle of the 1960s and 1970s, she quickly changed her mind. Visibly frustrated by the book's erasure of black sisters vanguard activism and the Catholic fight for racial justice, its cursory mentions of white sisters longstanding practices of white supremacy and exclusion, and its glaring omissions about the one black nun briefly discussed in its pages, the 65 year old ex nun quietly stood and departed the room. Several minutes later, she returned with a treasure trove, her personal archive from her tenure in religious life. In handing over the materials, Dr. Gray revealed that in the 1970s, the executive board of the National Black Sisters Conference had desired to publish a book documenting Black sisters' history in the United States. She also lamented to me the enduring invisibility of Black sisters' lives and labors in church and wider American history. Then in her very great wisdom, Dr. Gray gently encouraged me to consider expanding my attention to the mostly unsung and under-researched history of the nation's Black sisterhoods. We, the NBSC, were not the first Black sisters to revolt in the church, she quietly declared. If you can, try to tell all of our stories. And I just responded, I said I'd do my best and my best was pretty good. And so in my book, I recover the voices of a group of Black American church women whose lives, labors, and struggles have been systematically ignored, routinely dismissed as insignificant, and too often reduced to myth. For 13 years, I sought the untold stories of the nation's Black Catholic sisters, and I found no accounts bearing any resemblance to the fabled Hollywood tale of Sister Mary Clarence. I also failed to encounter Black sisters whose lived experiences confirmed many of the existing narratives of American Catholicism, or the master story of Catholic sisters in the United States. Instead, from a host of widely ignored archival sources, previously sealed church records, out of print books, periodicals, and over 100 oral history interviews, I bore witness to a profoundly unfamiliar history that disrupts and revises much of what has been said and written about the US Catholic church and the place of black people within it. Because it is impossible to narrate Black sisters' journeys in the United States accurately and honestly without confronting the church's largely unacknowledged and unreconciled histories of colonialism, slavery, and segregation, I address these violent systems of power and exploitation and their perpetrators, male and female, directly. In doing so, my book recovers an overlooked chapter in the history of the long African-American freedom struggle a tradition of sustained Black Catholic resistance to white supremacy and exclusion that most scholars argue does not exist. When confronted with a silence past, the greatest responsibility of the historian and the most radical thing that any person can do is to tell the story that was never meant to be told. My book then marks a new starting point in historical truth telling in the Catholic Church and wider American society. I argue that for far too long, scholars of the American, Catholic, and Black past have unconsciously or consciously declared by virtue of misrepresentation, marginalization, and outright erasure that the history of Black Catholic nuns does not matter. And offering the first full survey of Black sisters' lives and struggles in the United States, my book unequivocally demonstrates that their history does matter and has always mattered. And indeed, one of the core arguments of my book is that women's religious life in the Roman Catholic Church 
has long stood as a stronghold of racial segregation and white supremacy. Indeed, the development of African-American female religious life in the United States is, is, is made possible or created in response to the creation of, or made possible by the creation of all black sisterhoods that were formed in response to the anti-black admissions policies of the nation's um, historically European and white American sisterhoods. Beyond these anti-black admissions policies that we know exist, perhaps the greatest testament to the ferocity with which we know white Catholics rejected black religious vocations is the fact that historians cannot say with any certainty who the nation's first black Catholic nun was. Uh, the realities of racial passing and archival erasure suggest that we may never know her name or the exact circumstances of her life. What we can say for certain is that the first black women who we know professed vows in religious life in 1824 in Kentucky are not the first black women in the United States to seek admission into religious life. Indeed, what we know um, as early as 1819, a priest from New Orleans wrote the inaugural Bishop of Louisiana into Florida's offering a few girls of color who were desiring religious life to support the US branch of the Society of the, of the Sacred Heart established in the Missouri Territory in 1818. In response, their foundress, um, who is now a saint in the church, Rose Philippine Duchenne, um, does consider accepting these women into her community in an effort to solve her order's inability to find suitable servants at what they were running at the time, which was Missouri's first Catholic school and convent. And although she suggested that they be admitted or at least be allowed to wear the order's regular habit, she requested that they be admitted at a third class status below the convents, uh, below their converse sisters who performed the manual labor and also below their choir sisters who taught in the schools. For his contribution, the first Bishop of Louisiana and to Florida's territory who himself was a slaveholder, encouraged Duchenne to only consider candidates of mixed African and Native American heritage, whom he declared might otherwise be reduced to prostitution. Um, this Bishop who went on to found the academy that became St. Louis University in Missouri, also suggested that any candidates, black candidates be admitted to a, sub, a sort of subaltern profession with a different habit than converse sisters. He will also reiterate to Duchin, to Duchin soon thereafter, inaugural US Bishop John Carroll's defense of anti-black disdain and segregation as quote, a prejudice that had to be kept as the last safeguard of morals, unquote. For her part, Duchenne's um, superior in France, who is also now a saint, granted the request, provided that it was not known that the girls of color were members of the society. Do not make the foolish mistake of mixing the whites with the blacks, she wrote. You will have no more pupils. The same for your novices. No one would join if you were to receive black novices. We will see what we can do for them later. Now, although nothing seemingly comes of these tacit approvals until 1948, when the community will accept its first African-American member in New York City, we know that African-American requests to enter the Society of the Sacred Heart, which came to own over 150 enslaved Black people, did not cease. Indeed, we know that at least one woman who was enslaved by the community repeatedly requested permission to enter the community. She was never allowed to do so, although we do know that she remains very close to the community and her request to be buried with the sisters was granted. Um, indeed, we know in 1831, Duchenne is even thinking about sort of creating a separate all black auxiliary community to be able to accommodate the request that she is receiving even as her order expanded its holdings in enslaved human chattel and resisted abolition. Now the first successful community of black sisters in the United States are the Oblate Sisters of Providence. The community in Kentucky, which was an auxiliary to the Sisters of Loretto at the foot of the cross um, was a short lived community and did not survive the departure of the, the community's Belgian founder. However, the Oblate Sisters of Providence and the Sisters of the Holy Family um, which are not only the two first successful African-American sisterhoods, um, but also the first two sisterhoods freely open to Black women and girls in the Atlantic world, um, Af women of African descent in the Atlantic world, um, are able to successfully withstand uh, the opposition that they will face. 
The Oblates are founded by uh, four women of color, uh, most notably uh, Servant of God, Mother Mary Lange, who is one of six African-Americans currently under consideration for canonization in the church. This community in many ways is born out of the Haitian Revolution. Um, we know that Mother Lange is of Haitian descent who immigrates into the United States as a result of the rebellion in saint Domingue, which becomes the Haitian Revolution. So as thousands of immigrants of refugees flood into the port cities of the United States, um, there is in many ways a humanitarian crisis that develops specifically with a need for individuals to minister to these refugees. The challenge, of course, for those who are of African descent, both free and enslaved, is that they are going to encounter the racial bar in the United States and the ways in which they ne not necessarily sort of encountered it um, and wherever they are fleeing. And so a desire on the part of African descended Catholics to minister to those refugees who are Catholic um, really sort of creates the opportunities um, for the development of the Oblate Sisters of Providence and enough support within their respective diocese and archdiocese where they can gain the support of a handful of members of the clergy. In the case of the Oblate Sisters of Providence, um, what we know is that the four charter members, three char charter men members are basically running a school for the children of refugees. What's also very clear is that they're an active member, uh, active members of the religious community in Baltimore, that they are members of confraternities. Um, and it's very clear that the foundresses also have a vocation to religious life. Indeed, their French founder, Father James Jobert, tells us that for more than 10 years, they had wished to consecrate themselves to God for this good work, waiting patiently that in his own infinite goodness that he would show them a way of giving themselves to him. And obviously what we can recognize, right, if they've been waiting for 10 years, that means that they have been asking to go into communities. We don't have a sense of who rejected them, but there are only three communities that precede them in the Diocese of Baltimore, which is the nation's oldest diocese. They are the slaveholding Carmelites in Baltimore, the slaveholding Visitations in Washington, D.C., and the slaveholding Sisters of Charity founded by St. Elizabeth Seton. What we also know is that they face profound resistance among the wider clerical community. Although they have a champion in Jobert um, and in the case of the, the Bishop of Baltimore, but we also know that Jobert documents the resistance that the, the foundresses are uh, encountering. He wrote in his diary, quote, I knew already that many persons who had approved of the idea of a school for pupils disapproved very strongly that uh, forming a religious house and could not think of the idea of seeing these poor girls colored girls wearing the religious habit and constituting a religious community. Indeed, we know that several threats are made against the community. Um, even more so, we know that um, members of the clergy refer to them and characterize them as, quote, a profanation of the habit, unquote. Despite the opposition, they will survive. What's also significant about the Oblate Sisters of Providence is that we believe and we sort of recognize them to be the first Congregation of Women in the United Congregation of Women Religious in the United States to reject the racist and sexist notion that a woman born into slavery lacked inherently lacked the virtue uh, necessary to enter religious life. Indeed, what we know is that prior to the civil war, prior to the Civil War and the federal abolition of slavery, the community will admit at least eight women who began their lives in slavery. Um, in the case of one, we know that she is still enslaved while she is admitted into the novitiate and then is able to gain her freedom. Um, while before taking her vows. Also significant, um, and certainly what I argue, um, is that the Oblate Sisters of Providence, and certainly through the life of uh, Chief Foundress Mother Mary Lange, um, really offer us essential counterpoints to those who attempt to defend or excuse their slaveholding and segregationist peers as, quote, people of their times. It's always important to remember that the Oblate Sisters of Providence are also people of those times. They are not a slaveholding community, but even go so further as to admit enslaved, formerly enslaved women into their ranks. Among them is Sister Marie West, who is one of the earliest members. And if you go to the, uh, the archives of the Oblate Sisters of Providence today, they do maintain the manumission records of those um, members who came into the community um, having been born into slavery, but having um, been um, granted their freedom prior to that moment. Again, the Oblate Sisters of Providence, um, we know that there have been eight communities of Black sisters founded in the United States. The Oblate Sisters of Providence are one of three that are still with us. The second successful community is founded in New Orleans, Louisiana um, in 1842, although we know that its beginnings really sort of can be dated to 1836. 
They are founded by Venerable Henri Delil, another African-American currently on the path to sainthood. This community also is founded in response to the anti-Black admissions policies of the, of the communities that are ministering uh, in New Orleans, including the Ursulines, who are the first community of sisters to minister in the land territory that becomes the United States. The Ursulines are also a slaveholding community. At one time, they were the largest slaveholding community in the state of Louisiana. And we know that they own at least, or at least at one point, over 200 individuals and also never advocate for abolition. In the case of Henri de Lille, um, we do know, and in the case of the early Sisters of the Holy Family, we do know that these women are also um, organized in response to a system of concubinage that had existed um, within sort of French and, and Spanish controlled territories known as Plassage, where European men um, and sort of white Creole men would sort of take on um, Afro Creole women as sort of common law wives. And what we recognize is that many of the founding members of the Sisters of the Holy Family sort of recognize this as a form of sexual coercion and slavery. In part, many of them themselves are the products of this system. We note that um, from their first history, Mother Mary Bernard Degg, Sister Mary Bernard Degg tells us that all of the sisters were of the very first families of the city and only one, Sister Suzanne Navarre was a stranger from Boston. As for the rest, they were all natives of the state, but their fathers were all foreigners, some French, Spanish, or German. They were descendants from the first settlers of Louisiana. And certainly records indicate that Henriette Delille herself is the great, great granddaughter of Claude de Bruyere, who was the inaugural French royal engineer for New Orleans, whose free and enslaved crews built many of the earliest roads in New Orleans, built the first canals, built the first levees, and also constructed the old Ursuline convent which ironically, Henriette de Lille would never be able to enter as a candidate for religious life because of her African heritage and her unwillingness to pass for white. Also significant about the Sisters of the Holy Family, unlike their counterparts in Baltimore, for the first 40, uh, four or five decades of their existence, it's not really clear. We have sort of three different dates. Um, they were not permitted to wear veils and wear sort of religious habits to signify their consecrated state. And there are a host of reasons why um, they were not allowed to do so. So if you'll notice here, the only image that we have of Henri de Lille, um, this is taken around 1851, um, right after the community's founding members profess their first vows. And they are allowed to wear sort of a black dress to signify their, their consecrated status, but never a veil. Indeed, they will not win that right until after uh, the Civil War. And indeed, we know that they will also face profound resistance as they uh, win the right to wear their habits. Indeed, in their first written history, Sister Mary Bernard Dex tells us that we had a very hard time for we had many enemies who wanted to degrade our dear little community as poor as we were. We were persecuted by the Sisters of St. Joseph in this city. They tried all they could do to make us take off our habits. This was after 45 or 50 years that we had worked and suffered to have a religious habit. No one would think we were anything if we were not dressed in the holy habit. Now, what's significant about this episode is that the Sisters of St. Joseph who arrived to minister in um, Louisiana, in New Orleans, after the Sisters of the Holy Family, interestingly enough, the Sisters of the Holy Family are the first community of sisters to have a foundation in the state of Louisiana. Although there are communities that precede them in ministering in Louisiana, um, they all come from Europe, most notably from France. Um, the Holy Family Sisters are the first to sort of be established in Louisiana. And the Sisters of St. Joseph complain about the Holy Family habit because they believe that it is too similar to that of their lay sisters, who are their lowest ranked sisters. And so they complain and complain because they believe and they want the Sisters of the Holy Family to be recognized as the lowest rank of sisters in the city, in the archdiocese. And so they are forced to change their habit to be able to appease those complaints. Despite those challenges, oops, sorry. Oh. Despite those challenges, the sisters will survive and thrive. I'm having just a second. I uh, can't find my screen. Let's see if I can do this now. Uh-oh. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you. So they will survive um, and thrive. The third community that is with us are the Franciscan Handmaids of Mary, um, initially founded as the Handmaids of the Most Pure Heart of Mary in Savannah, Georgia in 1916. 
Um, specifically, the handmaids come about in response to a uh, proposal that is introduced in the Georgia State Legislature, which would have um, effectively barred white teachers from teaching black children and black teachers from teaching white children. And had this proposal passed, this bill passed, it would have effectively barred black children from the Catholic educational system in Savannah since there were no black sisters ministering in Savannah in 1916. In response, a white, in response, a white priest, Father Ignatius Listener, sends out appeals to the Oblate Sisters of Providence and the Sisters uh, of the Holy Family in hopes that they will be able to send sisters to be able to minister in Savannah. They do not have any sisters to send. So he sets out across the country in search of a pious laywoman to found a community. And while he is in Washington, DC, he becomes aware of Eliza Barbara Williams, who was a former assistant superior in a failed black community in Convent, Louisiana, which was sort of an outgrowth of the Sisters of the Holy Family. And she had also spent some time as a novice with the Oblate Sisters of Providence. But in 1916, she was out of that community and working as a domestic and door, um, sort of housekeeper um, for the Sisters of Notre Dame, Dana Muir in Washington, DC at their Trinity College, which is now Trinity Washington University. And in his uh, account of the founding of the Handmaids of Mary, Father Lin Listener sort of tells us that um, he was really impressed by Eliza Williams. Um, he says that he explained to her what is happening, what was happening in Savannah, and that she left the room, came back with her life savings, offered it to him, and promised that she would support him in this effort to found a community of Black sisters. And within the year, she has um, moved to Savannah, and within another year, she has recruited several women into the community. Now, almost immediately, the community will run into profound resistance from white Catholics, both religious and lay, so much to the point that they will um, eventually seek a northern mission. Um, in 1921, Mother Theodore, which is the name that she takes, um, takes a small group of sisters to Tenafly, New Jersey, where they serve as domestics for the Society of African um, um, the, the African Missionary Fathers, the Society of African Missions who sort of run, who support their community, and they will eventually found a ministry, find a ministry in New York City in Harlem, establishing the first Catholic nursery for Black children and then eventually establishing elementary schools um, for Black children in New York City. The last community that I want to briefly mention are the Magdalene's. Um, prior to 1922, an African-American woman or an African-descended woman living in the United States who felt called to a contemplative vocation as opposed to felt called to the charism of an apostolic community where they had a public ministry, whether it was teaching or nursing, those who had contemplative vocations had no other opportunities unless they were racially ambiguous um, or could pass for white. Um, in 1922, um, the auxiliary, sort of the Magdalene's, who are the contemplative branch of the Good Shepherd Sisters, organize an all Black auxiliary to them to uh, make possible an opportunity for Black women called to contemplative life. This community will last um, until the 1960s when they integrate in with the Magdalene's and then eventually integrate in with the Good Shepherd Sisters. Um, but I do also say that they are still present since one of the Magdalene's is still alive. There are very few records that have survived um, about the Magdalene's um, that I am aware of, except for these two photos and articles on them that appear in the Colored Harvest. Um, however, because I was able to identify and locate one of the Magdalene's, I am able to sort of recreate or at least sort of name some most of the women in these photos. Now, the fight to desegregate women's religious life in the United States is a long one. Certainly, we will have 19th century examples of African descended women going into white religious communities, either in the United States or leaving the country to go into European communities. In most instances, these women are racially ambiguous, can pass for white, or again, just simply racially indeterminate. And I say racially indeterminate because anti-Blackness is the bar for most communities of sisters in the United States, whether they are European or sort of were founded in the United States as white communities. Um, most communities would take Native American women. Many of them would also take Latina women and would also take women of Asian descent. And so for some Black women, um, one didn't necessarily need to be able to pass for white. One just simply needed to be able to be racially ambiguous if you would just could have sort of be perceived as something else. That being said, we do know that other sisters of color um, do have their own challenges. Many of them um, are not educated by their communities and oftentimes relegated to domestic labor, but nonetheless, um, they are generally admitted in many communities. 
Um, many of you may know the story of the Sister Servants of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Um, they are actually founded by two Oblate Sisters of Providence who leave the community in 1845 to pass for white. Um, in that particular case, oh, sorry. Um, in that particular case, um, those two members found that community first in Monroe, excuse me, in Monroe, Michigan, and then later expand the community into Western Pennsylvania and then later into Eastern Pennsylvania. After running afoul of some of the bishops, though, their chief foundress, Mother Teresa Maxis Duchman, who is also a charter member of the Oblate Sisters of Providence, will go into exile in Canada um, for nearly 20 years before she's allowed to come back in the United States and um, pass away. Um, this particular image that you see here is the only known photograph of Mother Teresa Maxis Duchman. You generally will not see this image um, in most sort of IHM institutions simply because she's not wearing the habit of the community that she founded. This particular photo is taken while she's in exile in Canada. And so she's wearing the habit of the gray nuns of Ottawa. And so uh, this is the image, the most of the images that you will see of Mother Teresa Maxis Duchman is sort of a, a etching based on this particular photograph of her. And sort of they impose the IHM habit on her because they simply do not have a photo of her wearing the habit of the community that she founded. And certainly we know that for nearly a century with sort of a few exceptions, that community will collude to suppress knowledge of their African-American heritage. Indeed, um, they go so far as to stop an attempt by one priest who learns um, by chance of Mother Teresa Maxis Duchemin and who was attempting to have her canonized, but um, the sisters agreed not to give him access to their archives. Indeed, in 1928, one superior's writing, we are convinced that silence is the fairest, wisest, the most agreeable way of committing oblivion to this subject. The Sisters of Charity also have an early black superior in the 19th century who can also pass for white. She is described in, their commu in her communities um, only sort of published history as the most hidden of the mother's general. We know a bit about her, um, specifically that she was born in Charleston, South Carolina, to either an enslaved mother or a free black mother and an English planter father. And she um, attains the rank of um, a high rank leadership rank within her community, eventually serving as a superior from 1891 to 1894 um, when she passes away. What we know from the oral tradition of the community is that after her death, one of her successors went into the archive and attempted to destroy everything related to her except a prayer book and a rosary. Um, but a photograph survived um, and also some other materials survived specifically as members um, in the 1960s were interviewed who would have been formed under her when she served as the director of no the, the novice dr directress for the community. In the cases of black women who enter white communities who could not pass for white, all of these women were forced to leave the United States to enter European communities accepting of their vocations. Um, the missionary sisters of the Immaculate Conception take a black woman who was their former student um, in 1880. Um, she enters the community in Rome, becomes sick and dies there. She is on the left, Frederica Law of Savannah, Georgia. Um, she was allowed to profess her vows on her deathbed and she took the name Sister Benedict of the Angels. Although she was admitted into the community, she was only admitted at the rank of a lay sister. Such would also be the case for Frances Johnson, who was uh, a native of Baltimore, who entered into the novitiate of the Franciscan Sisters of Mill Hill in London, um, and then initially was sort of uh, believing that she would be trained on an equal level, but eventually was only allowed to train as a Franciscan tertiary. She comes back into the United States and ministers um, with her community into her death in Baltimore. Her community would not accept another black woman until the 1960s. I do also wanna briefly mention Mother Matilda Beasley, who was the foundress of the first community of black sisters in the state of Georgia. Um, her story is significant in part because it will be her story that leads to the institutionalization of a anti-Black and anti-Native American admissions policies uh, by the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament. Mother Matilda, um, we know at some time in the 1880s, sails to York, England to enter into the novitiate, we believe, of a poor Clara community, returns to the United States and founds her own community. Um, however, by 1893, her community is suffering financially, and at the uh, encouragement of the Bishop of Savannah, she reaches out to Mother Catherine Drexel, who has recently founded the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament for um, Indians and colored people, and there is sort of a hope that they will either be able to integrate with that community, or at the very least, that the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament would be willing to provide novitiate training for Mother Matilda's community. 
But it's during this time that this community, the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament, um, decide to take their vote. Um, they take a vote on whether or not they would sort of allow these sisters to come into the community. And although the Indianals, they describe Mother Matilda as a very saintly colored woman, um, they sort of cite a host of reasons, including sort of um, sort of racially derogatory views about Native Americans and African Americans, and the unwillingness of some members uh, to live on equal terms with women of color as their reasons as to why that they will not allow the community to enter. What's significant about this episode is that just a few weeks before Mother Matilda and her assistant arrive in Philadelphia, the community had accepted a Native American woman. They had admitted her at the rank of a house sister, meaning that she was relegated to cooking. Um, but as Mother Matilda comes in, the community decides that they are not only gonna not, not only sort of decline admissions requests from African-American women, but also Native American women. Um, it's an interesting moment in the history in part because um, most sort of public accountings of this episode and the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament and their unwillingness um, to admit Black women has oftentimes been attributed um, to a request from the Black superiors um, asking Mother Catherine not to um, accept Black members. However, the superior that they cite was a superior in the 20th century when they in fact take this vote in the 19th century. So it's an interesting sort of intervention that certainly my book is making in this episode. Through the 19th century up until um, World War II, we will have um, a few examples of communities admitting African descended women into their ranks, um, really on a case by case basis, and most often only admitting women who are racially ambiguous and who are willing to cut ties with their black families. We know that the Sisters of, Chair, uh, Sisters of the Holy Family of Nazareth, which is a Polish community, admitted at least three women into their ranks between in the, uh, from, the 18th, from the 19th century um, until the turn of the 20th century. They were the adopted daughters of the first U.S. provincial of that community. But I do also want to make the point, and certainly that is the story of Black sisters, um, the growth of the Black sisterhoods would not have been possible if indeed Black women who were racially ambiguous, the majority of them sort of went to white communities and passed for white. In fact, I say the opposite is true. It's unclear how many Black women who could pass or white went into white communities, but I do believe that the vast majority of them who could pass or white still joined uh, the Black communities if they felt called to religious life. And I argue in my book that the story of Mother um, Consuela Clifford, who was born Rebecca Clifford, who was a superior of the Oblate Sisters of Providence, is perhaps um, a more representative story. In 1905, she is given the opportunity to integrate into a white community and pass for white in Philadelphia on the condition that one, she passed and two, that she cut ties completely with her visibly black mother. In this particular instance, she has an older brother who is wanting to leave Virginia and pass for white so he can take advantage of the privileges of whiteness in American society during this time. And while her brother is willing to leave the mother behind, he's not willing to leave his sister. And so he works with the white priest to find a community willing to accept her. However, she refuses. And she tells um, her educators who are the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament who also reject her that year um, that she would never do such a thing. Um, and she actually sort of writes, well, sort of we have it sort of reported in the historical record that she states, quote, that I should not have my mother visit me, I think positively wrong and not the will of God. My mother is making a great sacrifice in giving up her only daughter to God. She is doing it most willingly. Should I impose an unnecessary sacrifice upon her? My decision is that the white people have many to work for them, but the colored people have very few. They are my own people and I think God wants me to give them the first place. And I, do not, and I don't think that I would be blessed if I were to do otherwise. And I wanted to give you this example because we so often, when we talk about racially ambiguous black women who went into religious life, we oftentimes focus on the stories of the IHM foundresses or the Healy siblings, including the sisters, all of whom who enter religious life. But we also know that in those examples, these are individuals who are seeking to maintain and create a social and political distance from the African-American community. Whereas through the story of Mother Clifford and so many other Black women um, who enter religious life who are racially ambiguous, they demonstrate a commitment to Black liberation through Black uh, Catholic education. 
And indeed, without their decisions, the African-American sisterhoods probably would not have survived. And certainly we, cer we certainly know that the work of lay women, those who went into religious life, but those who maintained, um, founded schools, established missions, um, who really sustained the African-American community, but have been overlooked, um, are really um, a part of the story here, perhaps at the center of the story of the development and growth and the survival of the Black Catholic community during the most tumultuous years of Jim Crow segregation. So when we think about women's religious life as the stronghold of white supremacy and segregation, we can find examples between the turn of the 20th century up into World War II, when communities begin to rethink their policies, but also find examples of black women who enter into white communities and face profound resistance. This is Sister M. Uh, Frances Davis. She is the 14th Mary Knoll sister. She also passes for white in her community, although we know from the annal records that she sort of makes a deal with the sisters. She tells them not to accept her if she's going to be forced to sort of cut ties with her visibly black family members. They agree and she is able to remain in the community without sort of having to um, cut ties with those family members, although they did not until recently acknowledge her as their first black member. In other instances, though, we know black women who try to pass for white in community and who are caught are sometimes removed. One example of this involves a woman named Mildred Dobear, who was from Mobile, Alabama. We know that she enters into the Religious Sisters of Mercy in suburban St. Louis in 1929. Soon thereafter, someone from Mobile writes the Mercy uh, head in Washington, DC, informing them that the community in St. Louis has taken a woman who is a Creole. In response, a superior from Washington, DC writes the superior in St. Louis and tells her that she needs to be removed which she is eventually removed. We know also that this particular young woman is able to go and pass for white in a visitation monastery in Richmond, Virginia. She successfully does so. No one ever finds out about her racial heritage. The superior religious, uh, the Mercy Superior in St. Louis does not reveal her racial heritage in her letter of recommendation for this young woman who goes into the, this community. Indeed, it was me who sort of informed the community of this woman's racial heritage. Um, and then I, sort of talk with the family who gave me a photo, an interesting story. But even for these exceptions, the vast majority of white communities would not accept black women, regardless of whether or not they could pass for white or not into their ranks. Indeed, when I began doing oral history interviews with the members of the black sisterhoods, especially the Oblate Sisters of Providence, I mistakenly assumed that these women had been educated by the Oblate Sisters of Providence and then entered the community of their educators. And as soon as I began doing those interviews, I realized that that was not true. Most of them, in fact, had been educated by white sisterhoods um, that ministered in the African-American community, but would not admit black women into their ranks. And so indeed, that is the story of so many members of the black sisterhoods, young men, excuse me, young women and girls who are traveling sometimes hundreds and even thousands of miles away from their hometown to be able to enter communities willing to accept their vocations. Indeed, what is important to remember about the history of the Black sisterhoods is that they are not simply pre preserving the vocations of Black women rejected admission into white communities in the United States. They are also taking Black women from Canada, from Latin America, and the Caribbean as well. That the Black sisterhoods from their foundings are multi-ethnic and multilingual communities. So we get these amazing stories, such as that of the Burke sisters of Louisville, Kentucky, the Burke's family who come out of Ho the Holy Land of Kentucky will send five of their daughters to the Oblate Sisters of Providence. Um, one daughter sort of becomes sick and then leaves. Other examples, the Price of the Baltimore who send four of their daughters to the Oblate Sisters of Providence um, and one son to the Josephites. And then in the case of the Thomas family who come out of the Holy Land of Kentucky as well, who migrate into Akron, Ohio, will send three of their oldest daughters into the Franciscan Handmaids of Mary in New York City. And the youngest sister, Josephine, will desegregate the Sisters of St. Joseph of St. Mark in Cleveland, Ohio. This particular community actually can trace their lineage to an enslaved woman who was owned by the Spalding family. The Spaldings who will give the nation two of its earliest bishops and John Lancaster Spalding and Martin Spalding, as well as sort of an extended family member in Catherine Spalding, who was the foundress of the Sisters of Charity of Nazareth in Kentucky. And they are all slaveholders. 
it will not be until after World War II that we begin to see communities being forced to rethink the utility of their uh, immorality of their anti-Black admissions policies, first with contemplative communities and then with apostolic communities. Although they will face resistance at any turn, in the case of the first Black Sisters of St. Mary and St. Louis, we know that they will actually only be admitted on a segregated basis. Um, their community will build a separate novitiate, bar their members from entering in the mother house, into the mother house of their community, um, enforce segregation and dining um, and any social activity and as well, they will be among um, a select number of African-American women who desegregate white communities who are forced to profess their vows in a segregated profession. In the case of the Sisters of Mercy, and this is the, the story that I will end with, they themselves will also um, uh, go in many regards to extraordinary lengths to resist the integration of their communities um, in the early decades following um, World War II. In Chicago, we know certainly from a survey of general council minutes that as soon as white priests begin to put help put pressure and support the applications of young African American women who are going and desiring to enter into communities, particularly white communities, including the mercies, they will oftentimes be described as problems. Here in 1946, um, we have sort of the general council minutes from the Mercy Sisters from Chicago, noting that the provincial in Chicago reported that she is being faced with the problem of accepting colored girls as postulants. Mother understands a priest is sending in an application for two colored girls uh, to enter the novitiate. The problem was discussed by the general council, but no action was taken. Mother asked the members of the general council to give it serious thought and fervent prayer. In New York City, we know that there's a white priest, um, assistant pastor at the Resurrection Church in Harlem, who actually sends a letter to all the superiors in New York City. One will make it into um, the hands of the Religious Sisters of Mercy, in which he sort of gives a general inquiry about vocations, but asks a very searing moral question. Is the order Catholic enough to accept colored vocations? I'm in a colored parish and I'm immediately concerned with this information. And the answer that he will receive is no, 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 no. And certainly in the case of the Religious Sisters of Mercy, um, their response and particularly their response not only to that letter, but also the decisions that they make um, in the coming years give us great insights to the extraordinary lengths in which some communities went to keep black women and girls out of their ranks. In the case of the Religious Sisters of Mercy, they even write to the Vatican. In 1946, you have the superior, the head of the Mercy Union writing, um, to a Vatican official, encloses a copy of a letter that I received from one of our mother's provincial relative to the acceptance of colored girls to our institute. The problem is forced upon us because of the number of colored students we now teach in our schools. Even though the training of colored subjects would necessarily differ in some respects from the training of other subjects, the colored would no doubt resent a separate novitiate. It seems too at this time that the sisters in general would not welcome colored subjects into our present novitiates. And this is the letter that in many ways opened up my research because it's significant in a host of ways. One, it told us that black girls were considered to be problems before they ever stepped foot in the convent. Two, it told us that despite the fact that white sisters taught black children, that cannot be understood or signify a commitment to racial justice because the bar comes up when those same students want to come into religious life. And also significant is that in this letter, the community admits that they have sisters who would not welcome black women and girls into their ranks. So they understand that they have a problem of anti-blackness and racism. And so it gives us a profound sense of the kinds of challenges that Black women and girls who come into communities where they are not going to be welcome will face. But it also gives a sense that communities are not ready to take these matters and they do not consider anti-Blackness as disqualifying from religious life. Certainly in the case of the Religious Sisters of Mercy, I want to end with the, sister, the story of Sister Cora Marie Billings, who was the first Black woman to sort of enter the community and remain. And certainly the story of her aunts who were rejected admission into all the communities in uh, white communities in Philadelphia um, in the 1930s and 1940s, including the Religious Sisters of Mercy, and then they became Oblate Sisters of Providence. Also to sort of pay homage to their father and Sister Cora Marie's grandfather, John Aloysius Lee Sr., who was a prominent layman, the second African-American graduate of Roman Catholic High School in Philadelphia, the nation's oldest Catholic high school.
and also to say the name of his father, William Henry Lee, who was one of the enslaved people who labored for the Jesuits at Georgetown. That the story of Black sisters in the United States is a story of, of America, in part because so many of these women can trace their lineage to the earliest days of the church. That their stories remind us that there, are, there have always been two transatlantic stories of American Catholicism. One that begins in Europe and another one that begins with African descended people living in Europe and others who are living in Africa who will help to sort of build the American church as a result of their enslavement made possible by the transatlantic slave trade. Indeed, the stories of black sisters in the United States remind us that there has always been an articulation of US Catholicism that understood that black lives and souls mattered. And until we tell those stories, we will be a deficient in knowing and understanding the American Catholic experience. So I wanna thank you for your time and I'm gonna stop there and apologize already for going over. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. That was wonderful. Teresa, did you want to say any yeah, words? Thank you so much, uh, yeah. Professor Williams, for what you shared and the stories that you're opening before us. I, I know I'm I'm immediately ready to jump in with a question, but I'll <laughs> I'll, I'll let um, Tim respond. But I, I know a question that comes from from these these stories you share. There was this this striking letter around, um, are you are you Catholic enough? Um, and to, and then we might say, you know, to respond in a anti-racist or in a, you know, in, in that manner. And I wonder, as you look at this, as you, and you enter into your own um, kind of journey, how that question has um, entered your, your, your faith and your um, identity, but I'll, I'll let Tim, that's, I'm, I'm immediately say thank you for what you shared and also for what you invite us to reflect on, um, both as a mercy institution, Catholic institution, um, and to, to enter into this history more fully. But Tim, let me let you respond, and then we will um, surely be able to have greater dialogue together with the community gather. Thank you, Professor Williams. Thank you, Teresa, and, and thank you, um, Shannon, this is wonderful. Um, Shannon and I first met each other many years ago uh, on a couple of different panels. And I remember her talking about this project and I was thinking, this is a big project. <laughs> this is a lot you're taking on. And you know, when you started the presentation about the sister saying to you, we've been waiting for someone, um, you know, there's just so much going on here. So it's so rich, um, the, the archival, um, the amount of archival research that you did under any circumstances is just amazing, let alone I know some of the challenges you had with communities in terms of getting access, people, you know, the trust issues, um, you know, so much going on. Um, I guess my question, because it's such a large project and, and you're a trailblazer and we were speaking earlier before um, we started and, and Shannon saying there's so much work to be done, there's so much you know, we need more historians getting going on this. You know, when, when someone is kind of the first to write a work like this, um, it just opens up so many more avenues for research. Is, I feel like in many ways you are trying to tell an institutional history and a personal history and personal histories at the same time. Um, and we're also, we were speaking earlier, we are talking about the fact that uh, Duke University Press, who's uh, publishing the, the soon to be forthcoming um, book coming out, Subversive Habits, um, uh, you know, was said that we want to have a certain amount of photos. And then, and then Shannon said, you know, no, we need more because they are so revealing. But could you speak a little bit about that tension about how to talk about the institutional church, the Roman Catholic Church in the United States, the institution of these religious orders, both historically black orders and white orders, but also trying to um, capture the humanity of these women as individuals. Um, I think of when, you, when you're talking about Whoopi Goldberg and Sister Act and so forth is that um, sisters in general, in terms of the um, popular culture can oftentimes be uh, presented as caricatures, right? You know, there's a mis there's a mis uh, mystery behind sisters. What's behind that convent wall? What's behind you know that habit and so forth? And and so 
I think what's so wonderful about the stories that you tell about the individuals is bringing out that humanity of individuals, but you also have these policies and institutions at the same time. So is there, I don't know, that's, that's a big question, for, but I just wonder if you want to speak to that a little bit. Thank you so much. Um, you know, it took me a long time to, to actually understand what I had. At, at, at one point I was, you know, came to it really through an interest in sort of the history of black nuns and black power, really interested in sort of making sure that the story of the National Black Sisters Conference was told and sort of the work that that organization did. And then I expanded it, um, not only with the encouragement of, of Dr. Patricia Gray, but also recognizing that in order to be able to tell that story, I had to understand that story beforehand, right? To understand why you know, 60 some odd year old Oblate Sister of Providence, Mary uh, Consolata Gibson, who was the two members of her community selected to reintegrate the Catholic University of America in 1933, is at the founding meeting of the National Black Sisters Conference and is writing, helping to write on the drafting committee of their position, their position paper, The Survival of Soul. Like, how do I connect those two generations? How do I understand why this sister is there? and how she sees herself with these young women who are declaring war on racism in the American church. And beginning to sort of understand that this is a long struggle, right? Sort of when we think about why we've ignored sisters, and I think one of the reasons we've done this is because we have been, one, still focused on the priest and the struggle for priests, because that has been seen as synonymous, right? Sort of with the struggle for, against sort of racism within the church, but ignoring the fact that long before there were Black priests in the United States, there were Black sisters. And that indeed, sort of the successes of the Black sisterhoods made possible the successes of these men. And also recognizing that in many regards, the sisters were the desegregation foot soldiers, that the members of the Black sisterhoods, in order to get their schools uh, accredited during the Jim Crow era before the Brown decision, were quietly desegregating so many Catholic institutions. Um, and so how does that story fit within this larger Sort of understanding of why their history is their history is important. I think at one point, though, I had to realize one that this was indeed a chapter in the history of the Black freedom struggle. Right when Black girls are desegregating these white orders, they are part and parcel of the freedom struggle. That they are desegregation foot soldiers. Some of them understand themselves as such, but we have to understand that that's just a part of the post World War II desegregation campaign. We have focused on sort of these individuals who participated in these kneelands, right? Um, trying to desegregate the nation's most segregated hour. But decades before you have black girls going into communities doing something much worse, right? Because this is not one hour, this is 24 seven. Um, and they do not have the luxury of having newspapers and reporters follow them, right? Um, they don't have the protection that those things um, require. And realizing that when a woman or a young girl desegregates a white community, then she has to go desegregate the various convents, the institutions that her order um, administers, whether she is going to be a nurse or a social worker or a teacher. And so there was all this great history that was there that was very much a part of the freedom struggle. Many of these women were breaking barriers um, that we championed so many people for doing, and yet we didn't have sort of this understanding of what um, it all meant. Indeed, certainly even with attention to the Black Catholic movement in the late 1960s and 1970s, recent attention, there is sort of this uh, scholar who sort of makes the argument, right, you know, there may not have been a Catholic king, but there were plenty of Catholic Angela Davises and, and Malcolm X's by the 1960s and 1970s. But part of what my book is saying is that, one, King is not the only civil rights leader of significance, right? Um, there are plenty of women who were sort of building the movement outside of King. We also can't look for a Catholic king because King comes out of the independent Black religious tradition, Baptist tradition, the Catholic Church would never allow for the development of a king under those circumstances. But there were plenty of Catholic Elizabeth Eckfords. There were plenty of Catholic Ruby Bridgeses. So many of the women that I talked to, they were like, well, I desegregated my public school first, or I desegregated my Catholic elementary and high school, or I desegregated my Catholic college, or I desegregated the faculty of my, my order's institutions. And so I, one, discovered this history of desegregation and sort of a history of these desegregation foot soldiers who had not been heralded. And what I had to realize is that, yes, I'm telling an institutional story and I'm telling it on a personal level. So how about this? How about I narrate this story? Because black women are there, black sisters, religious and lay are there at every turn when we're talking about the history of the church um, from every turn. If there are African foundations of US Catholicism, we have to remember that the first Christian marriage that takes place in the land area that becomes the United States is between a free black woman in St. Augustine, Florida and a Spanish soldier. 
that African descended people are here from the very beginning, that our story of slavery, the US story of slavery does not begin in 1619, but it actually begins almost a century before under Spanish Catholic auspices, right? That we really have to grapple with what that means. So much of early African-American history is Catholic history, and yet we don't know this story. So what would it mean to narrate the history? What would it mean to narrate US Catholic history from the perspective of black women and girls? And my book is saying, let's do it from the perspective of black sisters. And when you do that, everything changes, right? Myths fall. Even if we're talking about sort of missionary efforts, I'm gonna say this last thing and I'm gonna stop so we can open it up for questions. But what stood out to me when I began interviewing women who were converts to the faith, and I was sort of assuming, you know, what were the communities? Who sort of brought you into the church? You know, so much of the focus that we have is really on sort of the efforts, missionary efforts of a small handful of white priests and sisters who extend their ministries to, to black people, certainly in the 20th century. And yet when I was interviewing all these people, they weren't citing white priests and sisters. They said, oh no, I followed uh, my family member. I followed, we had cradle Catholics who were in our neighborhoods and we followed them to mass. And they also cite repeatedly devout black lay women who are ministering in their community communities. When I asked them who modeled the life of prayer and service to which they had been called, almost all of them cited the faithfulness and self, self, selflessness and deep spirituality of family members, male and female, not white religious. And so then I was getting all these amazing stories, stories of black lay women who were teaching at public schools, who recognized vocations and young girls who took them to mass at the lunch hour. Um, in the case of, and I just want to tell one story and I'm going to stop, there's a great example from the historically Black Hill District in Pittsburgh, um, specifically a Black lay woman who operated a daycare. Um, her name was Sarah Degree, brought scores of Black people into the faith um, after World War II. And among them was Frida Kittle, who was in 1958 the first, who we believe to be the first Black woman um, who was admitted into a white sisterhood in, in Pittsburgh. And shortly after this woman's death, in the 1980s, Kittle's brother, who was Pulitzer Prize winning playwright August Wilson, lambasted the Diocese of Pittsburgh for failing to honor Degree's legacy of service and evangelization. And he stated, quote, every Catholic I knew that lived in the Hill District was Catholic because of Miss Sarah. If there was ever a saint, it was Miss Sarah. If she was white, they'd have a Miss Sarah Degree child care center or something. And so all of these recollections that I was collecting underscore the vital roles that Black lay women played as evangelizers and spiritual leaders and educational leaders in Black communities, roles that were so often overlooked, misrepresented, or altogether omitted. And so it was interesting with the Black sisterhoods in particular, because they always had all these requests to come and they could never accept them. Oftentimes, they took the most desperate of situations, oftentimes going to parishes that had been founded by lay women, Black lay women who had been holding the line in communities. And so for me, telling this story opened up another dimension of US Catholicism that has been overlooked. And so I said a lot, but that is what I began to realize that when we begin to narrate these stories, a lot of myths fall, but we also recover such beautiful stories of faithfulness that we need to hear at this particular moment. Yeah, I think that's really, you know, it can be, very sobering and hard to hear and difficult to hear and painful to hear. And there is a lot of pain, I think, that needs, you know, truth telling requires that. Um, but there's also so much inspiration too, you know, and, and there's so much positive. And along those lines, and I encourage people to, in the chat, if you have questions, to go ahead and type those in and we'll um, try to share those with Shannon. Sorry, that's my dog. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, one question did come in was, um, what might your work mean to Sisters of Mercy institutions like Salve, Regina, uh, who are committed to the critical concerns of, of, we have five critical concerns in Sisters of Mercy, but anti-racism is one of those. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, go ahead. So absolutely. I mean, obviously um, I first thank the Sisters of Mercy. Um, when I began sort of having trouble sort of running into barriers, getting access to records, um, in 2016, I was invited to deliver a talk at the Leadership Conference of Women Religious, the annual meeting. And there I asked sisters who were then grappling with the ongoing concern of racism and really sort of interested in sort of finding ways to build an anti 
to become an anti-racist organization, but also encourage all congregations to become anti-racist organizations, really sort of thinking about what was some of the ways in which they could do that. And what I said was, I need access. You need to know your own stories. You need to know exactly what happened, specifically communities that had Black members and who lost them or lost the majority of them or lost all of them, but to also know your place in the history of racism as it relates to the Catholic Church, reminding them that the Catholic Church was never an innocent bystander in any history of colonialism, slavery, or segregation. Um, it is important for us to sort of recognize that sisters have a profound influence. No one would say that sisters did not play leading roles in building and sustaining the church, right? But what does it mean that many of these communities, especially before 1850, are entangled in slavery? Um, are slave holding communities or communities that exploit slave labor. What does it mean that these many of their institutions excluded people of color and especially African Americans? What happened to the pioneer? What happened to black women who sought entry into your communities? How were your members treated? Those are the kinds of questions that we have to grapple with because it's all good and, and, and wonderful to say that the church and our gospel is anti-racist, but what have our actions shown? And certainly if we say that the sisters are responsible for building the church, that means that they are indeed deeply implicated in the church's deep sin history of anti-Black racism and white supremacy. And so part of what I was asking was one, I need access, um, but also encouraging communities to do that inward work. Um, and that absolutely matters. And certainly in the case of the Sisters of Mercy, because they were among the first communities and really a community that gave me extensive access, um, certainly there is a painful history there, but I would also say, right, um, we also know that the Religious Sisters of Mercy in Pittsburgh are absolutely essential to this fight. Um, certainly with the formation of the National Black Sisters Conference at Mount Mercy College, which is now Carlo University, sort of the role not only in Sister Anne Martin de Porres Gray, um, but also in the role of Mother Thomas Aquinas Carroll, who was the former president of Mount Mercy, then became a leader of the Mercy community in Pittsburgh, which was independent, and then became the head of the Conference of Major Superiors of Women and then became the Leadership Conference of Women Religious. And so that there is a history within the Mercy community, right? That is also painful, but there's also sort of this moment, right? Um, where Mother Thomas Aquinas to Carol in the wake of Dr. King's assassination and in the wake of the, an attack on Sister M. Martin Depores Gray in the convent, right? radically changes her stance. And, you know, Dr. Gray sort of revealed this, right? She sort of pulled me into her office after I'd been, had this confrontation in, in the convent. And she said, what do you need me to do? What do you want to do? But also how can I support you? And she promised that she would do everything in her power to do it. And she does. The National Black Sisters Conference was headquartered at Carlo for until 1974. Um, Mother Thomas Aquinas Carroll bought cars. They had a printing press. And she defended Dr. Gray, Sister Anne Martin de Porres Gray, at every turn and gave her the platform to also help expand the influence of the National Black Sisters Conference. So we also need to think about the ways in which we not only sort of tell these very uneasy truths about every community, but also to institutionalize these communities and the work that they have done for anti-racism. Like part of what bothers me and what I sort of say, right, is when we don't tell the stories of Black sisters, we miss these radical elements of when white sisters and white religious did stand up um, in really important ways. Black sisters don't desegregate all these Catholic institutions without some very radical people supporting them in, in the most tumultuous years of segregation. And indeed, you have this group of very small number of bishops who in 1921 are calling upon white orders to help the black sisterhoods um, open up their institutions to them. And what's amazing in this pamphlet that they send out uh, in 1920 and 1921, these bishops literally say, we of the white race have done much to degrade, to degrade Negro womanhood as, in, as is incontestably proven by the presence of five million mulattoes in our presence. We owe these women some reparation. And they literally use the language of reparations and cite the sexual abuse of black women um, and girls before and after slavery as a reason why they are calling for every Catholic institution to establish two scholarships for each of the Black sisterhoods to ensure that they can get their schools accredited. You don't get to that story without getting to 
and telling Black sister stories and looking at the ways in which Black sisters were excluded from Catholic institutions, regar you know, regardless of their Catholic status. And so, yes, it's a painful story. And yet you do have white Catholics who step forward, who say that this cannot stand, that this is in violation of our church. We have to sort of stand and be truly Catholic, right? Even though there are other people who are, the majority who are saying no, um, we miss those stories in which there were white Catholics saying yes. So certainly when we are looking for this blueprint and sort of looking at sort of the challenges that we face, we don't even know that we can go back into our history and look at these examples and use those as examples that we build upon in this moment. And so certainly I think that the, the Religious Sisters of Mercy in particular, while there is certainly a painful history of exclusion and discrimination, you also point to sort of the history in which the mercies have done and been, if you will, on the right side um, of, of, of the movement in, in really important ways. And certainly the story of the National Black Sisters Conference is one story, but there are also other stories that are there too. So I encourage folks, if there are any questions, to put them in the chat. I think people are kind of digesting a lot of <laughs> information here um, because it's that's the thing, you know, in history, we have something called his historiography where we we have these debates and we we look at what other people have written. And when there's not a record, a published record, like when you're the first one doing that, to get that out there, a lot of it is just telling the story, putting it into context, getting in a response. Um, and so I think it's, it's, you know, I think in many ways, the group online, we are digesting this uh, because it is so new. It is so um, not something we hear a lot about. I mean, the the, the history of uh, religious women in general is woefully undertold. Um, and then, you know, we, we lost um, great uh, scholar Albert Rubita, uh from Princeton University who, you know, coined the phrase um, minority within a minority, you know, for black Catholics and, and for religion. He, he wrote the history of religion in slavery and beyond, um, um, you know, but so to tell the story of, of black women in religious life, it's 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 a new story, you know. It's an old story, but it's new to people, right? It's it's new to to take it in. So I'm wondering, um, one thing that I thought about is as, as you've worked on this project for so many years and spent so much time with it, you know, your book's coming out right now in the spring of 2022. We're coming off. Well, I like to think we're coming off a pandemic. We're still in the pandemic in many ways. Uh, we're coming off of a lot of discussion about race in the United States, a lot of discussion um, about, you know, many different ways. Um, there seems to be a moment in, in some ways where um, the, the uh, culture at large maybe wants to seriously uh, think about this in terms of, you know, African-American history is American history. It's not designated to, you know, Black History Month or a side chapter. Um, on the other hand, we're also at a point where we're seeing the rise in um, you know, um, uh, right supremacy groups feeling emboldened and so forth. So again, a big question for you, but just as an author, as your book's coming out in this moment, uh, you, you, you had spoken earlier about uh, serendipity of kind of divine intervention. Do you, <laughs> what do you think about your book in this moment? Yeah, it's, it's interesting, right? Um, certainly no member uh, you know, no one who is in higher education, no one who is an educator right now um, can sort of ignore sort of the implications of these attempts to s criminalize historical truth telling, um, to ban certain books um, that um, offer more honest accountings of human history, whether it is American history, um, whether it is African American history, right? Um, certainly the founders of African American history, the field of black history, right, understood, right, that black history was not simply American history, but it was world history. And certainly on Twitter, I've sort of like coined the hashtag black history is Catholic history. And part of that is because we know as educators and certainly those of us who are specialists in African American history, um, certainly that one of the greatest weapons of white supremacy has been its ability to erase the history of its violence and its victims. And so it's 2022. Um, 
the first Black sisters that we know profess vows in the United States do so in 1824. So we're literally coming up on nearly 200 years of having Black sisters in the United States. And we have to really ask that very difficult question of why has it taken so long for the first full survey of Black sisters to come out? Um, you know, one of the challenges, certainly people have sort of argued about Black women's history and why perhaps it took so long for the field to develop, were the challenges around sort of what kinds of collections and archives um, acquire? Did Black women sort of leave these traditional sources that would be acquired by archives? Um, certainly during slavery, knowing that a significant portion of the population, over 90%, were non-literate. And so they certainly would not leave certain kinds of sources and sources in which they appear. They oftentimes appear in shadows. They sort of come through the gaze of people who sort of see them first as sort of property, as chattel, et cetera. Uh, the difference, of course, with Black sisters, right, is they leave us a lot of records. Um, we have baptismal records. We have, these are literate women. These are educators. Um, and so certainly in the 19th century, there are less resources than we have in the 20th century, but um, there's still enough to sort of tell this story. We have a plethora of sources, both archival sources, the oral history has been there, um, visual sources, um, and certainly as we move in the 20th century, just a host of sources. And so we have to ask ourselves that very difficult question of, why haven't people been wanting to tell these stories? What about these stories really upend all these myths that we, that we, that we, that that are going to be revealed to be myths, right? Um, about uh, the church as a whole. Um, Indeed, sort of when you think about some of these women, when they can trace their lineage to many of the enslaved people who built the church, but also many of these European Catholic families. Indeed, one of the earliest Oblate Sisters of Providence, Mary Aloysius Beecraft, um, who was born Anne Marie Beecraft, who now has a, a hall named after her at Georgetown. Certainly what we know from the historical record um, is that she has deep ties to the Carroll family. In fact, the historical record tells us that her father, William B. Craft, was the natural born son of Charles Carroll of Carrollton, who was the only Catholic signer of the Declaration of Independence. Um, meaning that the only sister that we know who has a birthright, blood right to the nation and church, right, is, is this black nun. Um, so again, when I say it's not hyperbolic to say that these women and their lives are the story of America, they quite literally are so. Um, and so the question is, why haven't we been willing to sort of grapple with this history? Um, we have to sort of talk about this. Um, this history is there. If I saw it in the archive, somebody else saw it in the archive too. And someone said it did not matter. Um, and so that's that's what we, you know, that's the uncomfort, right? You know, that's the discomfort, excuse me, um, of sort of telling these stories because they also force us to sort of ask different kinds of questions. Um, that um, that we're gonna have to ask. Um, and that's of, that's of everyone, right? Historians of women religious, but even sort of historians of the black Catholic experience. There mean, it, may, it matters that Cyprian Davis excluded any mention of Sister M. Martin DePore as gray and her presence as the only woman at the founding meeting of the black Catholic clergy caucus and what they did to her at that meeting. Father Cyprian is there because he's a founding member of the black Catholic clergy caucus and he erases her from that meeting and puts the, the National Black Sisters Conference reduces them to a one brief mention in the book on a timeline. And so we have to ask those questions of why. Well, thank you. You know, time uh, always goes quickly when we have uh, interesting conversation. I do want to just make, um, I want to thank you, of course, um, Professor Williams, and, um, you know, for so much for us to think about. Uh, I did want to, um, you know, there, was, there were some questions coming in the chat that we couldn't quite get to all of them. But I want to say this, uh, someone wrote, a note of gratitude from a Salve Regina faculty member. Uh, I want to thank Professor Williams um, for her the wonderful way in which she shared uh, the sisters' stories. She honored their history. Uh, the courage and faith they showed are inspirational. They embrace their identities and continue to work against systemic racism. It is a message for action today, exclamation point. Um, <laughs> Uh, so the inspiration there um, from your presentation, thank you. And then um, Sister Christina Martin, part of the Salve Regina community here, um, sent me a message uh, to just be able to share with everybody that the Sisters of Mercy do now have an Institute of the Office of Anti-Racism and Racial Equity and in a committee of sisters and lay persons from all over the country. Uh, this group is now engaged in educating uh, the community and non-community members about aspects which will help us uh, and bring awareness. 
Um, so I think it's that, um, you know, what Shannon mentioned, the, the, the internal work um, for institutions, for individuals to look inward, to bring the historical record out there, to keep asking those questions um, and, and try to move forward in a positive way. Um, and, and I think, you know, you're a model in, in uh, how you do that with your research. And of course, we're very excited to see the book come out. Um, uh, there's ways, how, how, do, how can people, um, they want to, uh, is there ways to pre-order? Yes, yeah, so you can pre-order now. Um, you know, I certainly encourage you to go through your local bookstore. Um, you can use sort of bookseller, but you can also get it in sort of the major vendors. Also, the Kindle version is still is now available. Someone told me, oh, you can download it now via Kindle. Um, I think right now they actually sort of push the publication date. It was May 6th. I think it's May 17th now, but it's certainly May 2022, currently available for pre-order. Um, and I do encourage you to support your local bookstore um, um, if you can. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I just want to join um, Tim and I'm on behalf of everyone who's been in the room today, just gratitude for all that you shared, the questions you pose to us and bring forward um, from the voices of the sisters um, whose stories you share. And those will continue to accompany us and call us forth. Um, and I, I know that we'll, we're, I want to, um, just express gratitude for that. And also a reminder that we get to continue this conversation a bit. So those of you who are part of the um, Mercy Interdisciplinary Faculty Collaborative um, focus on the critical concern of race, we're gonna be sharing with uh, um, Professor Williams a little bit further in a post dialogue. So if you can stick around for that. Um, for, for all else, um, we really just are so grateful for what um, we've been able to share with you uh, Professor Williams, and these questions, I know I asked you that one before, I'll carry it into our conversation <laughs> coming of this, you know, this, this, that was a real penetrating, are you, are you Catholic enough? And you're talking about Black history as Catholic history and saying, what is, you know, that mean, my question to you is kind of in your own journey, because I know this research has really shaped your own identity as a Catholic Black woman as well, you know, to say, okay, what does this mean for your Catholic faith? So I'm really um, interested to, to know um, how those stories live in you and, and, um, and where that points you forward. Um, so I don't know if there's, um, I, that's a teaser, I guess, for those who are gonna join us um, more, but maybe a question for all of us. Um, to carry to carry forward today. And just on behalf of the Salve community, we really um, just want to express gratitude for your work and, um, and labor and bringing this, this work forward for our community and what that um, calls us to. So thank you very much, Professor. Thank Lee. you. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you all I for really joining do. us today.